Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. The title for today is Climbing Our Giant Mountains. Now, I have an insert there in the bulletin. You have an insert. It has a different title. I changed it last minute. Sorry, but uh, I changed it. But it's still the same basic idea. Climbing Our Giant Mountains, Joshua 14, 6 to 15. Anybody facing a mountain or a giant this morning? <laughs> You're in the right place. Let me hear this one. Now, one of my, I was thinking about this, this guy we're studying, Caleb. We're going to look at Caleb today. And he reminded me of this, this guy. Um, one of my favorite shows I used to watch with the kids a lot was Crocodile Hunter. Remember Crocodile Hunter, the late Steve Ir- Ir- Irwin? And that guy was crazy. He was always hunting some dangerous animal, some dangerous reptile. And he had no fear. He would just go into these crazy places and latch on to a crocodile or some crazy dangerous snake. And it, you, I couldn't believe what he survived. And it was ironic that he finally was killed by this docile stingray, right? Or some fluke thing. It's just ironic. But the, that guy was crazy. Very entertaining. Very crazy. Just loved watching him. He was really, really funny. And, but we're going to see an even crazier guy today. This guy in the Bible hunted giants. Real giants. You know, we talked about how the biggest human right now ate foot 11 or something. There was a whole genetic race, the sons of Anak, that that spread out. They were all huge, you know. They were NBA centers. If there was an NBA back then, they would all have been the centers. Um, They were just a huge group. And these, Caleb, Caleb was a giant hunter. These were, these were wicked giants. Remember Goliath? David and Goliath, he was one of the descendants. Uh, nine feet tall, one of the descendants. These guys were wicked giants. They were depraved. They were under God's judgment. He wanted them exterminated. They were just wicked, wicked people. But scary people. But Caleb, we're going to see, Caleb was not afraid of them. He hunted them down. Whatever nobody else wanted to do, he did. He hunted these guys down. He was crazy. But we can learn a lot from Caleb and his faith. Now last week we saw how the Israelites were given the land. Their inheritance split it up. My lot in life, remember that one? But we saw how none of the Israelites fully expelled the enemy and fully enjoyed the inheritance that they were given. Remember we're talking about a physical land inheritance and how that's a picture of our spiritual inheritance. That's all a picture. Joshua, Jesus, Physical land, spiritual land, it's all a picture of what we're supposed to be doing. And none of these Israelites fully expelled the enemy and fully enjoyed their full inheritance except for one man. One man only. Caleb. And he faced the toughest battle of them all. And yet he's the only one to fully grasp his inheritance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the worship. We thank you for helping us get here. A lot of us had to climb mountains just to get here this morning. Had to battle through a lot. Had to battle some giant struggles in our life. But Lord, we just pray that your word would encourage us. Would encourage us and we would walk out full of grace. Really experiencing your grace in our life. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's read the passage. Joshua 14, starting with verse 6. And this is a wild one. Now, the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since that time, he said to Moses, while Israel moved about in the desert. 
So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as it is inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. Caleb can have any land he wants. Any land. In all of his, all the promised land, he can have any land he wants. That was his reward from God, which we're going to see for being faithful. And he picks the last place anyone would choose. <laughs> he picks the mountains, the hill country, but the, it's literally the mountain area of Israel. He picked the mountains with scary giants living on them. What was he thinking? That's crazy. He could have anywhere he could, anywhere he wanted. He gets first pick, first choice. And he picks this, this crazy area. And yet, because he picked that area, Joshua blessed him. He received Joshua's blessing for his choice. And if we want to be blessed by our Joshua, by Jesus Christ, we must learn some very important lessons from Caleb here. The first one is, I, I've got some P's there on the outline. The first one is preparation. Preparation. This, this tough fighting guy here, Caleb, he didn't just show up one day and decide to take a mountain. Right? He didn't just show up. He didn't just say, oh, I think I'll shut the TV off, put the remote down, get up off the couch and go on out and take that mountain. He didn't just do that, right? No, he had spent the last five years battling in Israel. He spent the last five years battling versus the Canaanites. From Jericho all the way up to this chapter 14, he had been in the thick of the fighting. The front line. That's what this guy had been doing. But I believe, so this, that's the key there, but I believe the real key to his preparation was what he refers to in Joshua 14, verses 6 to 9. I'm just going to read 6 to 9 again. Now, the man of Judah, men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, to serve the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And so we see that this was, this was the real preparation for what we see with Caleb coming forward to take the mountain and take the giants on. This happened back in Numbers 13. And we've referred to this many times. Moses sent out how many spies? Twelve spies. He sends out twelve spies. He says, go check out the land because we're getting ready to take it. And I want you to come back and tell the people how great it is and how... What a great place God is giving us. So he came back and he said, it's true, it's great. But ten of them said, but it's scary. There's giants living there with huge walled cities. Was it true? Yeah, it's true. But so what? So, they, so Caleb said, yeah, it's true, let's go take it. And they voted though. Board meeting, you know, elder board meeting. I, they vote. And ten of them said, no, it's too scary. We shouldn't go. And they, they poisoned the people. They spread this negative report. They said, let's not go. Only two stood up to the majority. Joshua and Caleb. He stood up to the peer pressure. He stood up to the majority. Boy, do we have to do that today? 
He stood against it. 10 verses 2. And then in Numbers 14, the whole nation said, we want to go back to Egypt. We had it so good there. We were in slavery. You know, the veggie tales, you remember that one? Yeah, we were in slavery. But, it, but they thought it was so great. We want to go back to Egypt. And Caleb said, no, let's fight for this. We can do it. And they were going to stone him. The entire, he stood against the entire country. And they were going to stone him for taking a stand for God. Finally, God said, that's enough. Bad enough. He puts his foot down. He says, you're all going to die. Anybody t over 20 years old is going to die in the wilderness. You're never going to go into the promised land because you didn't take that step. Only two people over the age of 20 are going to go in. Joshua and Caleb. The rest were dead. They didn't go in. But you see, that's what really prepared Caleb for the battles he was going to face. That's what prepared him to take that mountain. That's what prepared him to face the giants that he was going to have to face. Caleb decided as a young man that his God was bigger than any giant. His God is bigger than any giant. Good lesson to learn, right? He said, I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight. And each step of faith prepared him for the mountain and the, giant mount, the giants on the mountain. Each step of faith prepares us and strengthens us for that next bigger battle. It started when he stood against the, the, the ten other leaders. It, and it continued when he stood against the entire nation. They were going to stone him. It happened when he, when he came into the land. He walked through the, Jer through the Jordan and, and before the walls of Jericho. And all those battles of five years of battling and battling and battling. And finally, he gets to the mountain covered with giants. Each step, every step that we take when we battle something, each step that we take is preparing us for the next step. Each Battle prepares us for the next giant we're going to face. Every step, and the same thing, every compromise, weakens us for that next battle, doesn't it? Are we getting ready? Are we taking steps of faith? Are we standing up to the peer pressure? Are we conforming to the world or being transformed by the renewing of our minds? Are we fighting those battles and those temptations, those smaller temptations, because they're just going to get bigger? Are we, are, we, are we fighting these battles? Caleb did that, and he was prepared, which, and he also not only was prepared, he also persevered. And I call this one patience. He persevered. He was patient. Look at uh, verse 10, Joshua 14, verse 10. Now then... Just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Joshua while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. Anybody here 85 and over? You don't have to raise your hand. I know some of you are. I feel that old. Uh, but he's just getting started. You're not retiring. There's no kicking back. I mean, you can enjoy yourself a little more, you know, enjoy the, but there's no kicking back. He's just getting started. Even if you're 85, you can just be getting started being used by God. All right. Uh, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out, and I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. We see that Caleb waited 45 years. Talk about patience. He's 85 now. 85 now. Think about how frustrating that must have been for him. He was ready to go into the promised land 45 years earlier. He was ready. He had the faith. He was obedient. He was ready to go in and enjoy that land. But he had to wait 40 years because of someone else's mistake. Anybody else here? Anybody here can relate to that? We're paying the consequences of someone else's mistake. Something they did wrong. Someone very close to us messed up and we got to suffer the consequences of it. 
It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. You can imagine what he must have been thinking. What am I doing here in this desert for 40 years? The best years of my life being wasted. He was 40. He had 45 years. Best years of my life wasted out here in a desert. You talk about a midlife crisis. Think of the thousands of funerals he attended. <laughs> all of his contemporaries dropping like flies. Right? All around him. He, think of all the people he had to go help and bury. But, but at the same time, he knew what that meant, too. There was a positive side. Now, who's still left? He probably got out his yearbook. Oh, here's Isaac, most likely to succeed, yeah, most likely to die in the desert. Crossed him out, you know, kept crossing him out. He knew how many had to go still. They had to all die before he could go in. So how did he handle this dry time, this time in the desert? How did he handle it? This boring time, this grieving time, this frustrating time. Anybody relate to what I'm talking about? This frustrating time in the desert wilderness. How did he handle it? Well, we know. He stayed strong. He stayed strong physically and spiritually. The whole time he stayed strong. He kept practicing with a sword. Must look fun as, funny out there attacking cactus, you know, and with his sword, you know, and, and you, know, you know, he stayed strong. He stayed ready for the battle. He stayed completely ready. He was patiently persevering, waiting and staying faithful is one of the hardest things in life to do, isn't it? It's one of the hardest things to do, whether it's our ministry, whether it's a trial in our life, whether it's a temptation, whether it's some problem with our marriage or our family, whatever it is, waiting and staying faithful is one of the hardest things things in life to do. What will we continue? Think of our lives. Will we continue to faithfully serve God, to stay in shape, to stay sharp with our sword, the sword of the spirit, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Will we stay sharp with, with our sword, ready, ready for that? What keeps us going? What kept Caleb going? What kept him going? Clinging to the promise. He held on to that promise. 45 years he held on to God's promise. Clinging to the promise till the time came to claim it. To claim it. And that's where the third P is, the promise. Let's look at the promise here and starting with verse 12. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. You yourself heard then what the Anakites were, that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest among, man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. Caleb, you see in verse 12, Caleb held on to God's promise. He says, give me this hill country, literally this mountain, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. Giants and all. He knew it was on that mountain. It's covered with giants. But he said, give me this mountain. And the results in verse 13, what's the results? It says, Joshua blessed Caleb. He blessed Caleb and he gave him Hebron. Anybody ever been to Hebron? Holy Land tour? Hebron? Remember who's buried there? It's a very special spiritual place. That's where Abraham and Sarah are buried. That's where Isaac and Rebekah are buried. That's where Jacob and Leah are buried, all in Hebron. That's it's a very special place. Hebron means fellowship and communion. That's the literal meaning of the word, fellowship and communion. And Caleb found this with God. He found it. How did he find it? 
Joshua 15. In Joshua 15, next chapter over, verse 13. In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. From Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, descendants of Anak. He found communion and fellowship with God. How? He found it at the end of a brutal climb to the top of mount, a mountain, fighting a vicious enemy. That's where Caleb found fellowship with God. Caleb is the only one to fully gain his inheritance. You read the rest of Joshua, you read the book of Judges, you read through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. He is the only one to fully gain his inheritance. And he had the toughest battle of them all. But the result of that brutal climb and fighting this vicious enemy, the result was Hebron. Hebron. The closest fellowship. The sweetest communion. That's what he achieved. Think of our own lives. Think back to your toughest battle. Maybe you're living it right now. Think back to the toughest temptation you fought. The biggest trial you ever went through. When were you the closest to God you've ever been? When, we were, the, when were we the really the closest, most dependent, prayed more than we ever prayed? It was then. It was then. That's when we needed God the most. That's when we needed his mercy and grace the most. Then. That's what Caleb found. That mountain, that giant, resulted in Hebron, the closest fellowship. He was the one. Are we enjoying close fellowship? Are we enjoying communion with our Joshua, Jesus Christ? What mountain do we need to climb to get there? What trial are we facing? And it seems like forever. But will we persevere? Because listen, if we don't stop halfway up the mountain, we're not going to get to that fellowship, to that communion. What giant do we need to take down by faith? What temptation do we need to battle no matter how many times we fall, no matter how many times we're attacked? What giant do we need to persevere and to keep on fighting? Are we preparing for the battle? Are we preparing? Are we taking the small steps of faith? It starts when we're a young person. It starts when we're a teenager. Are we taking those small steps of faith? Are we standing up against the world? Are we being conformed? Are we standing up against the world? Are we standing up against the sinful pressures of this world? Are we patiently waiting? Are we getting mad and discouraged and... You know what I'm talking about. Or are we patiently waiting, faithfully serving... Right where God has called us. Are we faithfully serving? Are we staying in spiritual shape? 
Are we waiting in the trials, in the temptations, in our ministry until God refines us and prepares us for that next step? Are we clinging to the promises? Are we clinging to the promises? Are we ready when it's God's perfect time to claim that promise, to fight for that promise when it's his time? There are thousands of promises in Scripture. Thousands. We must know them. We must focus on them. We must put our faith in those promises. I put a, a, some in the outline there. Just a couple. You've got to find your own, but I, I get you started. This is going to prime the pump. Deuteronomy 31, 31, 6. God will never leave us nor forsake us. Right there in the outline. Romans 8, 28. God will work all things together for our good. All things. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. He will not let us be tempted beyond what we are able, but will provide a way out. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. His grace is sufficient for us. Philemon 1.6, he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.13, we can do everything through him who gives us strength. Philippians 4.19, God will meet all of our needs. Thank you, thank you. We already got a lot of them ready. 1 John 1, 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. Many, many, many promises in God's Word. We have to read God's Word. We have to find these. We have to memorize them. You can Google them too if you want. There's promises. They got them all listed. But, but you got to you know, dig it and, med and then meditate on them and cling to them and fight with them. Take them into battle. These are the promises you got to hang on to. Just like Caleb, he held on to that promise. Maybe you're here today and you can't claim the promises yet. Because you're not a Christian. You're not a child of God yet. You've never put your faith in Jesus Christ and become a child of God. You're still facing the giants of sin, still facing the giant of death, still facing the giant Satan. You're still facing that. But like Joshua, Jesus Christ has defeated these giants. He's defeated them by his death on the cross and by his resurrection from the dead. When he died on the cross, he paid for our sins. He made a way for us to be forgiven by his father. By his resurrection, he defeated Satan. He destroyed his power over us. And we can have that victory. We can share in that victory, just like Caleb did, by faith. Just as Caleb, by faith, we can share in Jesus' victory by faith and be set from every giant, sin, and death. We can live a brand new life in Jesus Christ. We can climb those mountains. We can face these giants. We can have victory in our life. If we, this life in Christ, in the power of his promises, we can have that by faith. John 3.16 talks about that starting point of faith. For God... So love the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That word believe means faith. It's the same word, Greek, believe, faith, same exact word. And it means to put our total trust in, our total trust in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his make, giving us a new life. We put our total trust in him. And the moment we do that, we, have, we share in Jesus Christ's victory over sin and over death. Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, how is God speaking to us? Maybe here today and you are not a Christian yet. You've never put your faith in Jesus. But you can be set free today from the giants of sin and death and fear and Satan. We can be set free today at this very moment by putting your faith 
in Jesus Christ. The simple prayer of faith. At this very moment, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, calling you to take this step. To, to get a brand new life, to live a brand new life in Jesus Christ. Right where you're sitting, right where you are, right this very moment, you can pray the prayer of faith. God, I want that new life. I want the new life you've promised us starting right now. And it goes all throughout eternity. I want that life. I put my faith in Jesus. I put my faith in his death on that cross for me. I put my faith in his resurrection from the dead for me. I turn away from my old life. I walk away from that sin and the garbage, the bondage, the shame, the rebellion. I repent of that. I ask you to forgive me. I surrender my life to you, God. I'm putting my faith in your son, Jesus. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, you have just been set free. You have just been washed clean. You have become a child of God, a son and daughter of God. And your life will never be the same. Every battle you fight, every giant you face, every mountain you climb, you will have God holding your hand, taking you through that battle. I want to encourage you to let somebody know if you've put your faith in Christ. Maybe you have a friend or family member here. Maybe tell me on the way out or fill out the card, stick it in the box or on the back of the bulletin, text me, call me, email me. Let somebody know because we're going to encourage you, be excited for you and encourage you in your new life in Christ. You may be here today and you're already a Christian, but how is God speaking to us? How is he convicting us today? What giant are we facing? What mountain has God called us to climb? Maybe the last thing we ever would have picked to climb. Would we commit to preparing every step of our faith, preparing us? Maybe it's a patiently waiting prayer that we need to pray this morning.
God, I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to stay prepared during this time of waiting. I'm going to stay focused on you through this time. Maybe you're really facing an extra vicious giant right now. And it's a promise that you need to take hold of. To find God's promise that applies to this battle. And to hang on to it and to fight with it. knowing that no matter what we're facing, if we hang on to that promise, God's purpose will be revealed to us for this battle. We'll have God's perspective for this battle. And we know that no matter what, we can't lose. If it's God's purpose, we can't lose. It's achieving his good purpose in our life. Father, we pray that every one of us would achieve Hebron, that communion and fellowship with you. I pray for extra mercy and extra grace as we face these battles. In Jesus' name, amen.